Uh, recently, I read an article in the Ami magazine, and I was very happy to realize that a lot of the source material and the Makoros that are quoted in this essay, we've already discussed last week. Like, for example, the Ramams in Hilchus Tshuva about how important it is to be part of the tzibur, not be porish minat tzibur, and feel the pain of the tzibur, or the Raman Hilchus Tainis, never to think that what happens is just a matter of uh, coincidence, but it's all part of a divine plan. Also, the discussion about the power of tefillah that we had. A lot of this Baruch Hashem we've discussed in the past. I've sent you two texts, which I hope you received. One is a very long text. It's about five pages long. Hopefully you'll find it in your phone and you'll print it out. It would be great. And that is Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz's Shmuzim to the Mir Yeshiva, in 1973, just 50 years ago. And keep in mind that right after Sukkot, Reb Chaim required that his students return to the yeshiva, despite the fact that it was still Ben Azmanin. And as we'll see as we go through his presentation, that he had a problem with the wives of his Avrechim because uh, they wanted their husbands to be part of the post Sukkot work in the house. There was a lot of things to take care of in the house, take apart the sukkah, etc., etc. And Reb Chaim addresses that point as well. And then I sent you another text about the mitzvot that apply to someone who goes out to battle and the love of Lotira, which enjoins us from going out to battle with a sense of fear. And there's a Rambam and a Rabbi Yonah that I want to discuss with you. So just as we introduce this, I just want to make sure you, you receive those two, those two texts and you have access to them. Because, you know, I like to learn a text with you. you. You know my style. Now, the great thing about Rabbi Chaim is that in addressing a situation that's almost identical to ours, what could we do if we're not on the front lines, Reb Chaim invokes a massive amount of source material. His Yedias in Agadat of Shas. Forget about, you know, Reb Chaim as a Lamdin and a Magid Shir, a Rosh Hashiva, but just his absolute uh, dominion, I would say, over Agadat is mind-boggling. And when I talk about Agadita, not only Agadita in Shas, but Midrashim and many, many different sources that he puts together, it's just uh, mind-boggling. Uh, in Rav Salvechik's class, very rarely, I was in the year for five years, Very, I can't even remember one occasion in which the Rav decided not to skip an Agadita, but rather to learn the Agadita with us. And the very few Shiurim and discourses that the Rav gave analyzing an Agadita are published because they're so rare and far between. But Rab Chaim didn't see it that way. And to him, Shas and Midrashim were all one entity. And to the same extent that we delve into the depths of the Halachis, we delve into the depths of Agadita as well. And his analysis of Agadita is absolutely stunning. And we'll see a few examples here tonight. I want to suggest that you see a video, a short video, if you haven't seen it already, from Rav Lau, the father of the present chief rabbi, the previous chief rabbi, in which he addresses the situation that we face today. And I could probably dig it up in my phone and send it to you if you haven't seen it. Of all the things that I've heard or seen since the break, since, shall we call it Shabbos, uh, um, Simchas Torah, this, in my opinion, on a personal level, was the thing that that hit home the most. I mean, he addresses the Chayalim and he speaks to them about Jewish history, 
Very fascinating. So Bli Neder will come back to that. I want to do what I did last week and introduce the Shia with a halachic discussion. Here's my question. I haven't seen anyone write about it, but I think we can analyze it. And that is the following. Would there be a mitzvah to kill Hamas, a member of Hamas, who at that moment in time is not endangering the lives of Jews? Meaning, is there a mitzvah to kill Hamas as a mitzvah in and of itself, not related to what's called Habal Lahargacha, Hashkem Lahargo? Do you hear my question? Because again, no one would doubt that Habal Lahargacha, Hashkem Lahargo, we discussed it in the case of Bob and Machteris, if you recall. But when it comes to Hamas, does the fact that a person identifies himself as a Hamasnik? and maybe even carries weapons, but at this particular moment in time, he is not endangering anyone's lives, do we still nevertheless have a mitzvah to kill him? And that would depend upon what concept or what mitzvah. Anybody? I would think he's a he's a chetzer of or a gavra of Kabbalah Hargacha. And there is this whole ideology is... Yeah, but Moshe, in, you know, in, it's not enough to say that he's, you know, he's a bala hargacha. Bimitzias, right now, he's not a bala hargacha. I, I need you to come to me. One of the Amalek. Excellent, mechias Amalek. Thank you, Rabbi Beasley. I owe you Amalek or midini Mochama, or midini Mochama, like you said last week. There's dini Mochama, which are different from Rodev. Well, again, I, I, I'm not even talking about the framework of Mochama. It could very well be that, according to many Rishonu, the mitzvah of Mechia Samolek is not limited to Milchama. And even at a moment when there's no Milchama, there would still be a mitzvah of Mechia Samolek. And I once told you a story. I want to repeat the story. It's a cute story. My father was sitting at a chasana, he and his colleagues, together with Rav Moshe Bik. And just for your history, I mean, you may know Rav Ezra Bik. This is Rav Ezra Bik's uncle, his father's uh, brother. Rav Moshe Bik was the final posek in his time in America. Anyway, they were sitting around at a wedding, and they were, you know, they were colleagues the same age as Rav Moshe Bik. They had all learned together in, again, you can't call it Yeshiva University because Rav Moshe Bik would be turning in his grave. Uh, but they were learning in the yeshiva together. They saw him at a chasana many years later, and they asked him the following, Rabbi Moshe, if we could prove to you that this person here is an Amaleki, what would you do? And in his inimitable style, he was a big badchen. He was very sharp, very funny. Rabbi Moshe says, I would take out my sword and I would kill him on the spot. There are many Rishonim who say that the mitzvah of Mechia Samolek is outside the gather of Mulchama. And it applies to killing an Amaleki. But the question is, who is an Amaleki? Do I have the right to say that a Hamasnik, a card-carrying member of Hamas, is an Amaleki? Doesn't the Rambam say, doesn't the Rambam say, Uchbar Ovad Zichram, like Mira? Excellent. In, in what context does the Rambam he add the words Uchbar Ovad Zichram? David, in what context? He doesn't say it. He doesn't say regarding Amalek. With he regard to regarding... the exactly, Moshe. Ah, Shavami, ah. In the case of the seven nations, the Palestinians, there, the Ramam says in Hilchus Malachim that this mitzvah doesn't apply today because Basan Cherev who Bilbel Asa Umos Ukfar Avad Zichram. We can no longer identify any of the descendants of those seven nations. So if I would tell you that this guy is a Girgashi or Yervusi, you would say to me, Mehechitesi, the whole world was mixed up. So Zikram, we can't identify no way how a Yervusi or a Girgashi, etc., etc. But in the very next halacha, the Ramam speaks about the mitzvah Mechia Samolek, and he omits those three words. He does not repeat Ukvar Ovad Zikram. And at the time of World War II, the Holocaust, Ramosha Soloveitchik making this diuk, I always learned from this diuk that you 
derive conclusions not only from the Ramam when he says something, but even when the Ramam omits something, Rav Moshe said that any any group or any nation that gets up and says, we will destroy the Jewish nation, that people has the status of Amalek. Meaning Amalek is not Zera Amalek, as we understand it, in the genealogical sense. It's an, and that's what Moshe was referring to before, an ideological identification with the destruction of the Jews. And that makes you into an Amaleki. So again, I'm not here to pass in any Shilas, you know, the rubs of Hall of Racha, because of the influence of his father, of Moshe, was opposed to what we call German reparations. And the Israeli government was taking in money from the Germans. The Germans wanted to, so to speak, clean their uh, matzpun, you know, their conscience. So they wanted to send money to Jewish people, to survivors, and to the state of Israel. And the Rav was opposed to it because he felt that the Germans had a status of Amalek, based on what his father said. And with regard to Amalek, we have to destroy the Rechush of Amalek. We're not allowed to benefit even from the possessions of Amalek. Supposedly, again, none of this is, is uh, clear, or shall I say, none of this is um, has been proven. The Rav changed his mind. He rescinded his original position. Because <clears throat> he realized that the state of Israel was building roads and highways from reparation, German reparations, it was impossible to uh, to oppose re- receiving these reparations. But the point of the matter is, no one can tell me that they know for sure, although there is a, a remez in the, in the writings of the Vilna Gaon, but no one can tell me for sure that the Germans are genetically Amalek, that they are the descendants of Amalek. But yet, Rav Moshe and his son, Rav Yosheb, they were of the opinion that the Germans had the status of Amalek. And I'm wondering out loud, I'm just thinking out loud with you, Rabosai. Nothing more. I haven't seen anything or heard anything. That Hamas would likewise fit this definition of Amalek. And therefore, even if at this moment in time, this Hamasnik is not endangering, threatening the life of a Jew, there would still be a mitzvah to take his life. Again, I'm not poskiting. Again, let's not, uh, Burzon, you know, don't get carried away here. But I'm just saying, I think it's a fair question in our context. Okay, if you don't mind, I would like to use our time, because we started a little late, to present some of the ideas of Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz. And I think this piece that I sent you, this document, I believe, I have no proof of this, was actually edited by Rav Chaim himself, because very often he speaks in first person and he refers back to a different part of the essay. But in any event, it's a reliable record of what Rav Chaim said to the Talmidim in the Mir Yeshiva while the Yom Kippur War was raging. And I think we should pay special attention to the sequence because Rav Chaim is addressing the question, what could we do when we are yeshiva students and we're not at the front line? What are we meant to be doing? And Rav Chaim has A, B, and C. So what I'd like you to do, if you happen to have a, a, printed, a printed copy of this, if you were able to print it out, if, if not, not, then I would like you to write down Roman numeral number one at certain points, and then Roman numeral number two, and then Roman numeral number three. Because I think Reb Chaim has a three-pronged attack and an answer to the question what we are obligated to do. And I think the sequence is very important. So I teach in Yeshiva in Beit Shemesh during the morning hours, and the menial of the Yeshiva got up in front of the Yeshiva and spoke about the power of our Tehillim, he said the famous line, Tehillim, Kenegatilim, you know what I'm talking about. And I wanted to raise my hand and sort of present a little bit of an objection. Obviously, tefillah is very important, but if you'll see, it's not first on the list of Reb Chaim. And I make a big deal about that. Reb Chaim's first point is about Torah study, not tefillah. Tefillah will be Roman numeral number two. 
And he quotes a Gemara, and again, his magnificent ideas of, of, of Agadic statements is mind-boggling. The Gemara in Brachas, Adaf Samach Gimel, I'm learning this together with you, Kol HaMarape Atzmo Midivrei Torah. Now, the word Marape is a verb, the noun of which is Rifyon. Rifyon means when you have a loose kind of laid-back attitude towards Torah study. And Rab Chaim is medayik that the opposite, if you want to be omed, if you want to have the koach to be omed based sar, it's got to be the opposite of kol amarape atzmo bidivrei Torah. And I'm very much reminded of another shmuz that Rab Chaim gave called hachana lekabola satora. It was a shmuz he gave before Shavuos, based on a parsha in Yisro, the parsha of Kabbalah's HaTorah. And Chazal tell us that in preparation for Kabbalah's HaTorah, it's basically in Orachayim HaKadosh, we have to run away from Rifyon B'divrei Torah. And Reb Chaim says that the paradigmic person in Tanakh who projects the image of the opposite of Rifyon Torah, meaning the total dedication to Torah study is Yaakov Avinu, as Chazal say for 14 years in Beis Shever for Shem V'Ever, he studied Torah Yom of Eli. he didn't even put his head down to sleep. Some of the contemporaries say that he didn't wear pajamas at any time. Of course, the Gemara says you can't go three days without sleep. But he never went to sleep because he was too involved, dedicated to Torah study. And this is the opposite of Rifyon with Torah. And when Klal Yisrael leave Mitzrayim, a few days later, they're attacked by their enemies, and Rashi says, Al Sherafu Yedeya Min Torah. So we can take this statement of Reb Chaim, and we could really, really apply it to many different statements of Chazal, that if you want to be safe during an ace sorrow, then you have to be marchik yourself, go far, far away from a loose and laid back attitude towards the study of Torah. We need diligence in Torah, dedication to Torah. We need what's called hasmada. And I'm going to add another word here, but I'm going to try to prove it to you from the next couple of paragraphs in Reb Chaim. We need ha'amaka Torah. It's not just enough to learn the daf yomi. We need something a lot deeper than that. And Reb Chaim goes on to say that the Bnei Yeshiva have this primary responsibility, but it's Ben Azmanim. So Reb Chaim says, Ben Azmanim is a time of Rifyon Torah. We have to transform it to a time of his Amtsus B'Torah, and therefore we curtail our Ben Azmanim, and we get back to the Safsoli Yeshiva. And it means that we, the married members of Mir, have to leave our wives. Says Rab Chaim, what about the wives? What do they have in an Ace Torah? What's their claim to merit and is chus for Atzola in an Ace Torah? You can't tell me it's Talmud Torah because women are exempt from the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. And therefore, Rab Chaim quotes another Gemara, Mesech the Sota Davchaf Aleph, a very, very famous Gemara, has to do with the Sota. And the Gemara says that Nashim Bamek Hazachyan, how does a woman save herself? In what merit? And the Gemara answers to Makomakdin Baleam Litalmatora, that they send out their husbands to study in the base medrash. They send out their children, their sons, to study Tashbar in the base medrash. And that's their schus. And this Gemara always reminded me of another pair that you may have in mind of partners where one was dedicated to Torah study and the other was behind the line, so to speak, supporting him. Which partnership am I referring to? Yisachar Zvulun. Excellent, Yisachar and Zvulun. Whereas it takes Zvulun, time to unmute, that's why. Right, I'm sorry. Whereas in Zvulun it says, Bechof Yamim Yishko, and he was in charge of commerce. He was bringing, bringing in the box, as we would say. And he was supporting his brother Yisach, who was Yodei Bina, who was dedicated to Torah study. And in that sense, Avrechim, every family in which a husband is dedicated to Torah study and his wife 
is supporting him from behind, raising the children, etc., etc. That's called a Sachar's Vuin relationship. And what schus do the women have to save themselves, protect themselves in an ace tzara? It's through the Torah study of their husbands in this context. And therefore, Abchaim says that the Avrechim should give up on Ben Azmanim, explain to their wives they have to go study Torah, and that study of Torah will save them from the ace tzara because the opposite of study Torah is Rifyom B'Torah, and anybody who's Merapei Atzma Yitam B'Torah is Ein Bo Koach Lamod B'Ace Tzorah. Reb Chaim goes on, and he says that even a Russia Marusha, the worst Hitler in the world, who wants to annihilate every last Jew, and that's Haman Russia, even he could appreciate the power of Torah study. And the Gemara tells us in Megillah, unfortunately, it doesn't say what daf. I think it's on Yudal, if I don't remember. And Mordechai is studying and teaching Torah to the children. Haman comes near him and asks him, what are you studying? Haman is curious. And Mordechai answers, we're learning about the Omer. And Unashal Mopar Mosvaseinu, if we learn the Torah of the Omer, it's as if we brought the Omer. And Haman responds by saying, I understand that your Torah and your Omer will overpower, will trump, if I can use that word, the Aseres Alofim Shkolim with which I bought Achashverosh to write and sign the seal and sign the decree for the destruction of your people. So that Haman himself, Hodas Baldin, Kimea Eidim, Domi, that's today's da for those who are learning that film, is Haman himself is confessing and admitting that the power of Torah can override his Gzera Lara Glashmanim. I don't understand if Reb Chaim and the Gemara have in mind a simple, shall we say, Pshuto Shal Mikra understanding. Does the Haman really, really appreciate the power of Torah study? I don't know. <clears throat> but perhaps on a subconscious level, Somewhere deep in the recesses of the nefesh of a Russia Marusha like Haman, there's an appreciation for the power of Torah study. And you know, the thought occurs to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> that when we pulled out of Aza, what was the first thing they did? Yamach Shema. Do you remember? They burned the shuls. They, they burned burn their the shuls. They couldn't tolerate the shuls. What does that mean? Now Reb Chaim quotes the Gemara in Erevin. And for this, Daf Samach Gimel, again Daf Samach Gimel in Erevin, we have to read a parsha in Sefer Yoshua. And Yoshua is out there battling to conquer Eretz Yisrael and defeat the seven nations. And at night, somebody shows up Vecharbo Shlufa Biodo. Who is that being that's holding an out an, an extended outstretched sword? A sword is always a Simon of Peronios. It's a mala. And Yoshua immediately understands that we must be guilty of some crime, and the Malach is warning us of Peronios. This is before Melchemist I. So Yoshua has a Yeshiva Shin Hakira. He's trying to figure out what mitzvah did we not fulfill? And he had two possibilities. One was the mitzvah bringing the carbon tummy. And once again, you would say, oh, sick, but mitzvah part of it a mitzvah. They were busy with the mitzvah Muhammad. They didn't have time to bring the carbon tummy. And the other possibility was bitul Torah. They weren't studying Torah. And once again, oh, sick, but mitzvah part of a mitzvah. I don't know if you saw that picture of a chayal who's learning the daf. I don't know if you saw that little uh, video. Anyway, so the Malach says in response to Yoshua, Ata Bossi, Ata with an ayin. Meaning, forget about the Bittal Atomid in the morning. Think about right now. Right now at night, you take a break from the, from the battle. You're not in the front line. And now's the time to learn Torah. Why aren't you learning Torah? And then the Pesach says, 
that after the Malach checks out, Vayolen Yoshua Balailahu Bitocha Emek, a very ambiguous pasuk. What does it mean? Vayolen and Yoshua goes to rest that night in the Emek, says the Gemara. Shalom be Omka Shalalacha. Again, I emphasize the word Omka. Omek of Halacha. It wasn't just that he was saying a shear in, uh, in uh, shall we say, Ben Ishchai or Mishnah Bura or something along that line. He was Lon be Omka Shal Torah. Again, I can't even imagine how he could get a nation of warriors taking a break at night and being Lon be Omka Shal Torah. Mind boggling. But that's what saved the Jewish people at the time of the conquering of Eretz Yisrael from the Charbo Shlucha Biyado. Ad Kana Kofa Alf. Torah study is first on the list and it requires diligence in Torah study. Again, something that in this article he, he repeats. I know he doesn't quote Reb Chaim, but uh, he probably had that in mind. And he emphasizes how important it is to study Torah. Today I saw a picture, a, uh, somebody sent me a picture from a yeshiva where at every single shtender, there's another name of a chayal. And while they're learning Torah at that shtender, they are thinking of that chayal. I was very excited about it and I want to try to pass this on to the two yeshivas that I'm teaching in now. So that's Roman numeral number one serious diligence and depth in the study of Torah. And I would add my own PS, my own comment here. It's not easy. Because you have to extricate yourself from all the news. Because if you're involved in the news and you're wondering if and when there's going to be a, a ground invasion and you're wondering whether or not the Air Force could knock out these bunkers in the subterranean city of Aza, and destroy all these tunnels so that Achai Elim Chashon don't have to go into those tunnels. And then try to concentrate in learning. Very, very challenging. My hat goes off to anyone who has the ability at these trying times to really throw themselves into Torah, into the Vayolen Balailu Bi'emek Amka Shalalach. Tremendous achievement for those who can achieve it. The Eitzah Shnir, Roman numeral number two. Tefillah, of course. Tefillah, the power of Tefillah. And Chazal tells us an amazing thing about the Mulcham against Midian. There's a double language in the Pesach, seemingly redim, re, redundant. It says, Elif Lamate, Elif Lamate. What does that mean? A thousand and a thousand? So the Medrash says, Mikol Shevet V'Shevet. In every single Shevet, there was Elef L'Mulchama the Elef L'Tfila. They made a division. Half of the Shevet would go out to battle and the other half was back behind the lines in Tfila. And Reb Chaim is medayik from the Lushen of the Chazal. Haritzrichem Chad Kenegin Chad. And he adds the following, And maybe he has in mind, that we should put the name down, as I said before, on the table. And you write the Hebrew name of the Chayal and his mother's name. He says, This is a Chiddush Gadol B'Torah Shiva Tfila. Who would think that in an Eist Tzor, an Eist Molchama, we should focus on the Chiv Tefillah. And now he goes on to quote Yeshayo Navi, who twice dubs the Mabel, we'll read it this Shabbos, as May Noach. And the famous question of Chazal, why is the... This is not a very very good uh, approbation for Noach, that the Mabel is called May Noach, as if to say that he was the Gorem of the Mabel. And Reb Chaim quotes the Chazal. Once again, unfortunately, at least in my printout, he doesn't quote where it is, if anybody knows, that Lefi Shalom is Palal Bnei Doro. 
He did not pray on behalf of his generation. And now Reb Chaim comes up with his own Kalvachomer. Very rare. I mean, we assume that Chazal knew the intricacies and the rules and regulations that govern a Kalvachomer. We don't have those rules. We don't know how to make a Kalvachomer. But Reb Chaim tells us there's a Kalvachomer. Because Chazal tell us that the tefillah of the rabbin is so much more effective than the tefillah of the yachid. That's why we done B'tzibur. Because we have no guarantee that God will hearken to our prayers as yachidim. But when we gather together the rabbin, that tefillah takes on a brand new power and efficacy. And therefore, says Reb Chaim HaKal V'chomer, if Noach, whose tefillah was a tefillah's yachid, could have saved perhaps the door of the Mabel, then our tefillah, he's talking to the yeshiva in the mirror, as a tefillah's rabbim certainly could achieve a, an effective hatzola from the ace sora of the Mulchama. And once again, Moshe Rabbeinu has a tefillah against Klal Yisrael after the Gzera, that Moshe Rabbeinu would not enter into the land of Israel, he would die in the sand dunes of the wilderness. Moshe Rabbeinu has a tine against the people. Why didn't you pray on my behalf? And the implication seems to be that had Klal Yisrael B'tfilah Sarabim stormed the pearly gates, if they would have had a tefillah, they could have changed the Gzera. And for Eschanan, the Gematria of Eschanan is what? 515, Moshe Rabbeinu put forward 515 tefillahs, and they didn't work. But one tefillah of Rabbim could accomplish more than 500 tefillahs of a yachin, even of that leader of Klali, so the great Moshe Rabbeinu. And now Reb Chaim wants to quote a Gemara in Baba Basra Daf Yud about the Haruge Lud. And I believe that what Reb Chaim is doing here, and please read his text and tell me if, you, if this resonates, He's trying to give the Avrechim a sense of identifying and appreciating the Chayalim who are out there in the front lines. And the Gemara tells us about Aruge Lud, that they were willing to sacrifice, which they did, sacrifice themselves for the sake of the people of Israel. And the Gemara tells us about Aruge Lud, that ain't called Birya Yechola Lamon B'mechitzasam. That when we go up to the, after Mea Yesrim, up there to the Gan Eden, and we want to get a seat somewhere in the proximity of those who were Moser Nefesh for Kiddush Hashem, forget it. Ain Adam Ome B'mechitzosam. We can't even come close to them. And here, Reb Chaim goes on, in what I call Roman numeral number three, to discuss the issue of pachad, or to be more precise, anti pachad Now, I have a kasha on Reb Chaim. And my kasha is based on the Rambam that I sent you in the second document, which is called the Inyan Pachad Milcham. The Rambam says... In Perak Zion, Mihilchas Molochim Alochetesvov, Miha Isha Yare, Verach Levov Kimashmao. A Chayal who's out in the front fighting and battling of Mulchemis Mitzvah is not allowed to be in a state of fear. And what is his fear? Shain Bolibo Koch Lamud Bekishre Mulchama. If he wants to fulfill the mitzvah of milchama properly, he should rely on the Almighty, who is the protector of Israel, Umoshio. Vieda, and the Chayal should know, shall Yichud Hashem who also milchama. He is fighting a Mulchemes Hashem. V'yosim nafshu b'kapa. No hesitation. Go out there like a lion and fight. 
Lo and he should blot out any thoughts about his family. Lo beishto, lo bebanov, yimche zichro milibo. Unbelievable language of the Rambam. He should completely erase them from his memory. Don't allow yourself the luxury of thinking about your wife or your children. The yifne bechol gavra lemilchami should have his mind single-mindedly focused, excluding anything else but milchama. And then the Rambam goes on to say that if he starts thinking, well, look at the danger that's involved. You know there are. Bullets flying in every direction, pagazim in every direction, then mavil atzmo vi over belotase. He violates a lav in the Torah. Al tiro, the Torah says, vi al ta'artsu mi paneem. And called me Yisrael tliyam itzavaro. Unbelievable language. But let me ask you a question. If you are with me in studying this Rambam, you should be able to answer this question. There's only one way of going here. When the Torah prohibits Pachad, with the Lavim that are mentioned here, I'm going to use a dig, like a uh, brisker kind of Chakira. Is that a din in Melchama? Or is that a din that goes beyond Melchama? And would apply to every citizen, even those who are not fighting in the battle. Anybody? Again, I know it takes a minute to uh, unmute yourself. It's only Bidin Milchama. Rabosai, this is Parak Zion Milchus Molochim, which is exclusively dedicated to the Dinim of Milchama. There are so many myriads of Dinim that apply in Milchama. There are Lavim in the Torah, a whole slew of them. And included in those Lavim, me dine kishrei milchama is that a, a chayal who's fighting on behalf of Klal Yisrael, the milchamas Hashem, is enjoined from having any le- level of fear. And he says, I mean, I Yisrael, he says, Shekol Dimei Yisrael Tzuluyin B'Tzavaro. Yeah, he's not talking about you and I. Right? He's talking about protecting ourselves at the borders against our enemies. I mean, one, one, of, the, one of the three p'turim for a soldier is if he's afraid, No. So Correct. once he leaves, once and he leaves the, the front lines, I'm talking no... about. Correct, well, Elliot. Well, that's well, a din in Mulchama. In saying, fact, from Chaim Shmulevitz himself in another shmooze for Parshas Shoftim, he speaks about the contagious nature of Pachat and how if a chayal is out there fighting the battle and he's overwhelmed by fear, how that's going to demoralize the troops. Because that kind of attitude is contagious and it brings other people down. There's no question in my mind. Again, you can question your, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But in my mind, there's not even a shadow of a doubt that the Ramam understood these psukim in their context, Kipshuta Shav Mikra, as Dine Mulchama. These are Lavim that apply to Yotze Mulchama. And therefore, I found it a little bit strange. Because Reb Chaim knows the Rambam, Reb Chaim Shulevitz, I mean, knows the Rambam better than I do, that he would stand up in front of the yeshiva and mir and talk to them about not having pachad. These were the Avrechim who are in the Oref, they were not in the Chazit, they were not up front in the front lines of the battle. But my son, Binyamin, sent me Rabbeinu Yonah from Shari Tshuva, which you'll see as the first source on this page. Now, Rabbi Yonah in Shar Gimel counts the mitzvahs. And it's very important to me that you meticulously read in the Shari Tshuva, Oslam and Aleph, and Oslam and Beis, meaning he separates two mitzvahs here. And in the first of the mitzvahs, which is Lam and Aleph, he addresses the mitzvah lahorish, lahorisham, to inherit the land, conquer the land of Israel. And he writes, ki tomar when you'll say in your heart, how could I conquer Eretz Yisrael and defeat these seven nations? Rabim agoyim ha'elam many. These nations are much more manifold than I am. 
How can I fight the battle and conquer the land? The Torah says, Thou shalt not fear them. And once again, I understand from Rabbi Yona that in Oslam and Aleph, he's addressing those soldiers who are now, like in Yoshua's battalions, who are conquering Eretz Yisrael. But take a look at Lom and Beis, which Rabbi Yona separates as a separate mitzvah. He opens up with the psukim in the parasha Milchama, but look how he interprets them. I'm going to leave it as an open blank. What should be the next word? What? Chayal. Or Lochem. Or Yotzeh Lebulchama. No, listen to the language of Rabbi Yon, Yonah in a separate independent counting. Shem Yira Adam Ki Tzara Krova What does Tzara Krova mean? Doesn't necessarily well, mean a war. He's got Tzaras. Tzara Krova, I don't want to list all the Tzaras. I don't want to be Motsi Mipi, you know, Al Tifto Pele Satan. can give you a whole list of Tzaras never. Ki yire ha'odom ki tzara krova, tiye Yeshua Hashem belibo. V'yivtach alea. What midah, what attribute is, according to Rabbi Yona, obligatory and is enjoyed by the Torah under the halacha of lo tiramiyam? Which midah, which attribute? Bitochon. Bitochon. Who wrote an entire treatise about Bitochon? Anybody know? Rabbi Yonah. The Chovas Halavavos. Excellent. Rabbi Nebuchai. Tamar Goodman's, uh, you know, was the greatest uh, Orthodox basketball player. <laughs> His daughter was interviewed. She's a spokeswoman. Did you hear her? All about Rabbi Nebuchai on Midas HaBitochon. Who else wrote a book on Midas HaBitochon in contemporary Let's call it the 20th century. The Chazanish. The Mida of Bitochon. Rabbosai, where is the source in the Torah for the Mida of Bitochon? That I am obligated to rely on Hashem. And according to Rabbi Yona, it's written in the Parsha Mulchama, but it should be taken out of context. As a general mitzvah, so there are two mitzvahs here. In brisket terminology, tzvei dinim. There's one din, an obligation to f- run away from Yira that's incumbent upon a chayal, and that's in Nobel Amad Aleph. And in Nobel Amad Beis, Rabbi Yonah has a separate mitzvah bitachon, kishe Yira ha'odom ki tzara krova, tia Yeshua Hashem b'levavo v'yivtach aleha. I found that absolutely stunning. And it might explain why Reb Chaim Shmulevitz got up in front of his, his soldiers. Avrechim who were dedicated to the study of Torah and told them and warned them about Pachat and told them to rely on Hashem. And as I said at the outset of this discussion tonight, the most powerful short presentation that I heard since the Mulchama is that of Rav Lau. And if you've seen it, you'll remember that Rav Lau turns to the people of Israel and he says, what is the people of Israel with regard to Mulchama? He says, we are a nation of lochamim, of soldiers. And he says the following, it's not just Gidon and Shimshon Agibar and David Melech, who is the great warrior. It's Avram Avinu. It goes back to the founder of our people. Because when four Moloch and four kings defeat five kings and the poet comes to tell Avram that his nephew Lot, the great Tzadik Lot, I'm being facetious, was taken captive. He's a hostage. What does Avram do without hesitation? 
without even blinking an eyelash. And he is called Avram Avinu. What does that mean, Avinu? Avinu means that our genetic code is a derivation from Avram. How many soldiers does he take out to battle? 318. I want to share with you something I heard many, many years ago from my Rebbe, Rab Moshe Shapiro, Zechot Tzadik Levrocha. Rab Moshe says, if somebody can do the math for me, very quickly, that the word Yeush, Yud Aleph of Shin, is Bigamatria. Who can do that for me? What's the Gematria of Yeush? 317. 317. How many soldiers did Avram Avinu have? 318. 318. We go beyond Yeush. Or as the Rebbe used to say, Ein Yeush Ba'olam. A Rebbe Tzach. Li Olam and Yeush Ba'olam. We go beyond Yeush. Yeush is 317. We are 318. And according to one opinion in Masech the Nidorim, how many soldiers did Avram Avinu have in his battalion? One, because Eliezer is Bigamachia 318. So we have in our bloodstream, Lochamim, the ability to go out and battle. And what does Avram Avinu teach us? By taking 318 yeshiva bachrim, I'm sure they were all wearing tzitzis, and going out to the front battle against the four most powerful kings at the time of the universe, of civilized nations. The Mida Bitoch. How could 318 Shlubi Yeshiva Bachram, pardon the expression, fight against the four most powerful forces in the world? Four kings. And this is the Mida Bitoch. And Rabosa, if it were up to me, I would tell you that when you recite three times a day the first brach of Shmon Esrei, which is called Avos, and forget about Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov for a minute, the threesome, the three musketeers, I would focus my attention on Avram, as Rashi says, Lo Yichto El Bacha, because Baruch HaTashem, Mogen Avram, Mogen Avram means you have protected within us in our spiritual genetic code, Avram. We are the embodied Avrams. And we go out to battle. And Milchama is not something foreign to the Jewish people, as many of us think, mistakenly. But Milchama is embedded in a very genetic code. And the entire Parshan Shoftim of Milchama and the Mitzvah Milchama with so many Mitzvahs in Tariyad. But now we're saying, to be mashlim what Rav Lau said, that not only is this obligation incumbent upon those who are on the front lines, but we are also part of that Mulchama. We have also inherited something from our great father Avram Avinu, and that is the Mida Bitachon. And once again, I'm going to tell you, Rav say this is not easy. I open the news and we're talking about what's going on in the north and the other Hezbollah, the other Hamasniks, the other Nazis up in north and I talk. they talk about what it means to go in a ground force you know, to try to it's very hard very challenging to be imbued with the spirit of Avram Avinu of Bitochon and yet Reb Chaim says it and I think it's Rabbi Yonah that we, even if we're not at the front lines, by the way, there was a campaign here to join the army for Haredi boys. So I read it carefully because I did my miluim after I did my basic training, I did miluim for 13 years in the army. And I was thinking, maybe at my age, I should be out there volunteering for the Israeli army. I don't know where I'm going to find my Pinchas Choger long lost, can't even find my boots. But then I read it carefully, and it said from the ages of 25 to 55, there went my dream down the tubes. My son, Binyamin, 
pointed out that if you read the Sefer Achinuch carefully, he adds a certain word. You know, the Sefer Achinuch is divided up into two parts. One part, he presents the mitzvah as he counts them. He gives you the Ika definition of the mitzvah. And then he gives you Sharshah mitzvah. And sometimes the Sharshah mitzvah, the Chinuch, expands the scope of the mitzvah. So when you read the first line, you get the impression that he's defining the restricted application and, and scope of the mitzvah. But hold your breath until you see the Sharshah mitzvah. So look what the Chin Sefer Chinuch says, if you have it in the file that I sent you. In mitzvah tov kuf chaf hey in parashat shoftim, he says she nimneenu that God has enjoined us from larots ulafachim mina oivim be ace hamilchama, and you read the sefer chinuch, you think he's on the side of the Rama. and at the mitzvah of avoiding pachad <coughs> is incumbent only be ace milchama, but then take a look at the sharsham mitzvah, he adds a couple of words. He says, We're going to add a little uh, carrot here. What he means is, even those who are not at the front line. So I asked you the question about 10, 15 minutes ago. Where is the source for the mitzvah bitachon? And it seems to me that both Rabbi Yonah and perhaps we can add the Sefer Achinuch saw and discovered the source for the mitzvah bitachon, which is incumbent upon all of us, b'yais tzara, in the parsha milcham. They extricated from the parsha milchama, not extricated, what's the word I'm looking for? They um, Extrapolated. Extrapolated, thank you. Who Who is that? Uh, Ellie. Ellie. I owe you one, Ellie. I owe Rabbi Beasley, and now I owe Ellie. Okay. Mr. Shem, we'll see each other face to face and the end of the Zoom. The Ramam and Sefer Mitzvah also adds a strange phrase, which you don't find in the Mishnah Torah. And in Sefer Mitzvah, Mitzvah's Lota Senun Ches, when he speaks about the Azhara Milira Bies Mulchama, that we shouldn't have fear during the war. Then he adds, Why is the Ramam introducing here emuna? I mean, this is a mitzvah that applies to Dini Mulchama, as we saw in the Ramam in Hilchas Malachim. But perhaps the Ramam is alluding to the fact that there's a greater mitzvah that goes beyond Mulchama, and that's the mitzvah of, of emuna. And we talk. Now we're on the second page of Reb Chaim. Uh, we don't have too much time, but let's at least finish the first section, and you'll tell me if you want to go on in a different occasion. Yaakov Avinu, when he realizes that Esav is moving towards him with 400 soldiers, the Apostlech testifies by Yira Yaakov Miod. And Yaakov was in a state of fear. The Medrash says, Esav ledarko holech, v'yata sholech lo ko amar avdecha Yaakov. There's a tviya here against Yaakov in the Medrash. Yaakov is going in his way. His way is the way of Cherev with 400 soldiers. Now, what about your, Derek? What about your approach, Yaakov Avin? Machzik biyozne kelev over berivolo lo. You're not facing him with your cherev, with your power. Cha'af sha'olech esav li lochem. Says Reb Chaim, what do we derive from this medrash? Esav is going out to battle the arba meos ima ish ivo. And not only that, according to the Medrash, each one of the 400 soldiers <clears throat> in Esau's commander was a commander of 400 soldiers. That's 400 times 400. Esau holech li lochem v'kuf samach ribu ish imo. Ba'filu hachi. Nevertheless, ain't lira mehem. Don't be afraid of them. 
because Esav is holy for Darko. It's like you're giving power to your enemy. And why? Because you're in a state of fear. This is one of the various shmuzim that Rav Chaim gave during the Yom Kippur War. However, there is an entire series of shmuzim that he gave. All told, I think there are six of them, five of them, or maybe six, I don't know. Six, six mamar. So we barely scratched the surface on of one out of six. Again, I have no agenda here other than the fact that you know, this shia sort of forces me to learn this because I say three shirim in the morning on three different topics, Mesech of Basra, another one on Hilcha Shabbos, and a third one on uh, Shnai Mikra Vechet Targum. And then in the evenings, I'm learning the laws of Kiddush in a yeshiva, different yeshiva. And in the afternoon, I'm busy with Dafyomi. I don't know, Dafyomi is like a Shibut Olam. So I really don't have the time to put into this, but I would like to consider the possibility, but it's up to you. Maybe we should continue this. In Mirza Hashem, we won't have to talk about Mulcham anymore, but we will be able to talk about the Midah Bitachon, the Koch HaTfilah, the Koch of Torah. And let me end with a Tfilah and a Bracha to all of us. We should be so good to see a great Yeshua Again, I don't know how and where it's going to come from, how it's going to happen. Nobody knows how this is going to play out. <clears throat> but we need Chizuk in the midst of Bitochan and Amun and Hashem, which we zoche, to hear the Sorot Tovot and to bring about the Geula Shleva Bekar of Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.